Hello. This week we're talking about self-assessment. Last week talking about career theories. Hopefully we developed a base for uh, our exploration, thinking about how we construct our identity and connection to career, or at least we started on that conversation. But none of the career development theories really work unless an individual has done a degree of self-assessment. And so that's what we're discussing today. Talk to you about a few different assessments that we can explore within this course. But of course, there'll be other assessments that you can do outside the course as well. Our objective today is to reflect on and understand different approaches to really looking at strengths and skills and how they can impact our career. So first, we'll really think about the self-assessment factor, what it means. We'll then look at skills and how we can identify some of those that are really impactful to us. We'll look at strengths, how those are different from skills and how we can leverage them. And then lastly, we'll talk about application and connect it back to what we're doing today. First piece really focusing on Holland. So I would hope remembering him from last week, right? So that trait factor theory, and that is where a lot of the self-assessment uh, that we utilize today in career centers originate from. According to Holland, the four different sectors of self-assessment that we want to focus on are interests, what are our likes, our skills, what are we good at, which could or could not intersect with interests, our values, what uh, motivates us or what's important to us, and then our traits, what is our personality like, and oftentimes values and traits uh, intersect, which we'll see when we talk about this a little bit more further. And so this idea, if we even you know, focus then again on Holland's theory, this idea that we're going to go into a career and that our intersection of interests, skills, values, and traits are going to impact the types of careers that are enjoyable to us or that we would really be amenable to. And even for those who aren't as big a fan of trait factor theory, maybe you really gravitated towards another theory that we discussed in the previous lecture. Regardless, it's even a good Jesuit practice to reflect on what we're good at, what we like, what our personality dictates for us, or what our uh, personality leans towards for us, and then also our values, what's important to us, right? So this lecture is going to cover some of those pieces. The first thing, interest, is the easiest one to start with because it's a matter of just thinking what we enjoy spending our time doing. Uh, and sometimes these are clear to us, and sometimes we might not even think about it. So it's also worth, uh, with any of these different sectors that we're discussing, to potentially ask a parent or someone close to you and say, you know, hey, what is something that you noticed that I've really been interested in since I was young? And hearing other people's opinions can help impact, oh, you're right, like I've always liked public speaking. Maybe I didn't think about it because it was natural, but maybe I really like taking a room and, you know, talking to them and uh, being really energetic. Right? Like that could be an interest, also a skill that you didn't know that you had. So here we have a collection of interests, things that we enjoy doing. And then we have skills, really thinking about what we're good at or what we're able to, and that um, asking other people's opinions can really come into play more with skills because we often have blind spots. A misunderstanding or a common misconception of what a career is meant to be is often that your skills will dictate what career that you pursue. Uh, knowing that we're psychology majors or pursuing an intended psychology major, it might be, well, I know that I'm good at critically analyzing, so I should be in a profession or an industry where I have to critically analyze things. Uh, but it could be that that's a skill you have, but maybe it doesn't align with your traits as much. Um, we look at our traits and these are personality pieces that we would describe ourselves as. Uh, so if we would describe ourselves as um, needing a lack of structure, uh, potentially then a you know, position where, yes, you get to critically analyze, but you're going to be regimented in how you do that and in what way you do that, then potentially that job wouldn't be a good fit, even though it's aligning with your skill set. And so that's where we're doing this more comprehensive review. And so we have here a list of traits, and they align often with values. Values are things that we find important. Uh, and so we'll see, let's, I'm actually going to go flip back and forth just for a moment to give you an example. So a trait could be that you are um, helpful, maybe that you're reserved, and that you're witty, okay? Even though one of your traits may have been reservation, looking then at your values, if one of the core values that you hold true to yourself is something like leadership or relationships, Putting yourself out into situations where you need to be a bit more unreserved could be important to you because the values supersede the traits. 
So I'll task you, this isn't part of the weekly analysis, but go through the traits, think of your top three, because many, many may apply to you, but think of what your top three that you're leading with. And just based on these here, it's not like this is comprehensive of all the traits you could have, but it's a good start. So jot down, what are my three top traits? And then do the same with values top three values and think how those impact one another. How much overlap do you see? Do you see areas where sometimes your values supersede traits or traits supersede values? Uh, how is that intersection? That's, I suppose, a mini assessment. Now, NACE, uh, National Association of College and Employers, they do a survey of employers every year and they're asking employers, what are you looking for in a candidate? What are the top skills, right? So thinking back to that uh, slide, and the skills that they list aren't the type of skills that we put on, or as I put on that slide for having you think of, they're skills that are more uh, about your ability to communicate, about your ability to develop a team, uh, solve problems, think analytically, organize, prioritize work, things of that nature. They're going to be skills that you're developing in the classroom that you're developing with your liberal arts education. And so it's not that um, when you're going into a particular role, after your undergraduate program, and maybe you're going into graduate school, but let's imagine that you're going into a job immediately after graduation, the likelihood is what they're really looking for as a candidate is a candidate who's going to fit well within their organization. Uh, and that's, you know, a candidate who's going to work well with others, a candidate who's able to look at a problem and really think about, you know, whether the different solutions can be. So you're not just going with the first solution, but a solution that is best for the situation. And it's all well and good to know that employers are looking for skills that we're learning in the classroom that gives us more freedom to really think about our traits and values and how we want to fit into an organization. We don't have to beg for an organization to take us. We have this ability to assess our traits, our values, our skills, and our interests and look for a good fit. Now, in that vein, one of your activities is going to be to complete the Employable Skills Self-Efficacy Survey. This was created by psychologists for psychology students. And it's really meant to look at four areas that psychology uh, programs and related careers typically use. So communication skills, analytical inquiry skills, collaboration skills, and then professional development skills. What I'll say in a little bit of an apology is that the test is only in paper. We don't have an online version of the test. Uh, so you may have to print it out to take the survey, but then I'll have you score your own survey, which is good practice if you haven't done a kind of a complicated assessment scoring before, because it's going to have reverse scoring and other types of items for you to play with. But then your task will be to upload your scores for those four areas into, into Blue Line. And the idea is that you can see where your really strong and looking for areas where potentially you want to improve or work further on. And there's a lot of information about why that study or why that uh, survey was created. And that's also posted on Blue Line, the actual survey. So if you want to read all those uh, additional abstract and information on the survey, please feel free to do so. But that isn't a requirement. The requirement is just that you take the survey and upload your scores. And please do let me know if you have any questions on that. So transitioning from skills to strengths. Now, skills are going to be things that it's a little bit maybe more clear that we're good on. Again, we did talk about sometimes we're looking for vicarious experiences or lo we're looking for people outside of us to help us identify skills. But strengths are going to be uh, not necessarily the type of work we're doing, but how we're doing it. And so that's really where a strength is different from a skill. The idea of strengths, the strengths assessment that you're going to have taken or uploaded your responses for was developed from positive psychology. And you may have encountered this in other psychology courses, but this idea that, well, let's not focus on what unsuccessful people are doing wrong. Let's focus on what successful people are doing correctly. Let's reframe the narrative. Using this positive psychology, Donald Clifton developed Strengths Quest or Strengths Finder, and now it is called Clifton Strengths for Students. <laughs> I'm having to remember that, but it is written on Blue Line. Uh, regardless, this assessment identified 34 talent themes. Uh, and 34 talent themes are the same. Well, in essence, every person operates with all of the talent themes. So we all have every strength within us. It could be empathy, belief, discipline, achiever, etc. However, we most easily operate out of our top five to 10 strengths. Those are the ones that come most easily to us. And my apologies for saying talents and strengths and using them uh, as if they're the same, a future slide will show you how strengths and talents align. Regardless, 
the basis of strength psychology is that if you know how you operate, you'll be more successful. Because the people that were surveyed by Clifton and his team and identifying what they knew about themselves, uh, what if they knew or recognized their strengths and then how they operated in the workplace, the people who were most successful didn't have a particular type of strength, but it was just the fact that they knew what their strengths were and how to leverage them. So that's really why we're looking at this strength assessment today. Uh, so that idea that it's not what you do, but how you do. And we have a visual to show you that. So here, are two pictures of a giraffe. They're doing the same thing, right? They're getting the task done. They are eating. But the first giraffe is leveraging their strengths. They have a long neck, and it's designed to let them eat from the type of tall tree, right? And then the other giraffe is operating from one of the lower strengths that they have, right? They do have the ability to bend down to eat the grass, but it's a lot harder. And so strengths doesn't say that you can't get something done if you don't have a, a particular strength or talent, but it's saying that if you know what your strengths are, you can leverage those and it'll come a lot easier to you. So here is that slide I was referencing about why I was uh, switching out talent and strength, because a strength is a talent that hasn't had investment in it yet. So a talent is your natural way of doing things. So for an example, I am naturally empathetic. That is my top quotation mark strength, but it's not actually a strength until I invest time in that talent and I take time to practice and develop and build knowledge about it. And so the other piece that can happen, here I'll scroll here. So the other thing that can happen is that if I'm not aware of the barrier of a strength, so again, because I'm using empathy, uh, if I use empathy in overdrive, it's that I could be, become a sponge, right? So I, I can't turn off my ability to empathize with someone. So if someone else is upset or in tears and I'm not aware that a barrier of mine is that I have a propensity to absorb that person's emotions, then I can get upset and start crying because the person in front of me is crying, right? So recognizing your barrier label can help you take that strength and elevate it so you know how to channel that strength and avoid any obstacles that it could present to you. And that would really be the framework that Clifton would want you to think of in strengths. There aren't weaknesses, but barriers. A weakness would imply that you aren't able to do something, but a barrier would be that you can do it, but you need to know, or it would be wise to know the best way for you to complete that task, or knowing what obstacles are, help, are keeping you from completing that task. The rule of thirds here is thinking of that 34 strengths. The top third of your strengths are the ones that are more naturally like your talent, so they're easier for you to tap into. And then the middle third would be uh, talents that, yeah, you could break into them and you could use those talents. It maybe isn't the most natural, but you can see yourself doing it. And then the bottom third of the talents are the ones that are more of a struggle typically uh, to channel into because they're not aligned with your natural inclination. And the biggest barrier that someone has, and this probably makes sense to us, isn't their 34th strength, but often one of their top five or 10 strengths on overdrive. You know, thinking of someone's competition, that could be a strength and you could uh, align that strength to really succeed in the world. But if you let competition go into overdrive, it can cause friction with friendships. It could become blinding. It can become a barrier. Now, this slide gets to a bit of the weekly analysis that we're asking you to do a helpful exercise that the Clifton team suggests doing with your strengths is look at your top five strengths and name them. Pick out the words and phrases from the talent descriptions that really resonate with you. Like, understand, yes, this strength, I identify it with it for these particular reasons. And then think about how you have used that strength in the world. Uh, think back maybe to a time that you used it in a project or a time that you used it at work or a time that you used it with family and think about how that strength has helped you be successful. And then lastly, aim it. Think about how you can leverage that talent to overcome a challenge in the future. Now that you know that you have that strength, how could you utilize it going forward? So that's what I have for you today on this beginning of self-assessment. Now, self-assessment is a continuous process. It's not a one-stop shop. In fact, we're going to be doing it throughout our lives, but hopefully this helps you get the ball rolling. So when we look at future lectures, where we're looking at different psychology opportunities, when we're looking at informational interviewing or we're looking at networking, we're thinking about the strengths we have to help us complete those tasks and in a way that makes sense for us. Please let me know if you have any questions or difficulty in accessing any of the surveys for the weekly analysis or the weekly activities uh, this week. There's plenty of links in the supplemental materials to different assessments, so please do look at those if this is an interesting topic for you. That's all I have. Have a great week.